To pick up where we left off, we're still doing within subjects design. This is just part two of the chapter nine um, lecture. Again, we just divided the, um, the lecture in half just for file size purposes. Um, so we were talking about um, counterbalancing um, and how to best do that. Um, and the whole reason we're counterbalancing is, again, to balance these practice effects over um, all the conditions equally. Um, by doing this equally, we can cancel out any of these kinds of practice effects that could then become threats to internal validity if we allowed them to co-vary with either our independent variable or our dependent variable. So by counterbalancing and by shifting, um, again, um, by balancing out these practice effects, um, we we um, no longer have these risks of eternal validity. So let's go into some details about how we can do that. So there's two main kinds of practice effects. The first of which is linear practice effects. Linear practice effects are just what they sound like. They're practice effects that go in a nice straight line. Um, participants change in the same way following each presentation of a condition. So you get a little bit better every time. And so the way your practice effects looks is a nice clean line kind of going up because we get a little bit better every time. Or every time we're a little bit more bored and so every time we have a slight decline. But again, the change is happening in the same way after each presentation of the condition. Whereas nonlinear practice effects don't have that nice um, straight line kind of pattern. Participants change dramatically following kind of an admit one of the administrations of a condition. Um, it may be based on that condition. It may just be kind of when they get that um, that moment where they understand something. Um, these sorts of things. An example would be um, a participant experienced some sort of insight about how to complete the task. That light bulb moment. Aha! Now I get it. Um, we've all had that when we're doing kind of a um, learning learning a math problem or learning some kind of statistical formula where all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and we understand it and every all that confusion that we would had before kind of isn't necessarily there. Um, this can be an awe uh, if, you, if you've never had the light bulb go off for statistics I'm sure you've had the light bulb go off in, um, in some other area um, where again now you understand it in a way that you didn't previously and so while we didn't maybe have much change preceding that there's a big change now and now we understand this very differently. And because they have that you understand this, the participant understands this differently, you're, they're likely to use this, inset, this insight in subsequent conditions. So we've had a dramatic change um, in, in a very nonlinear way. So examples of these would be um, for linear practice effects, um, if we said somebody gets a little bit better every time. So if we're going to add numbers to this, they gain one unit of practice with each administration of a condition. So if we say that there's no practice effects when we start the study um, because we've... Um, because they've never done it before, um, and we add one each time, um, so we get a little bit better each time. So there's um, three conditions. We're going to repeat all of them twice. Um, so this is what we'll learn is an A, B, B, A kind of counterbalancing. Only we have three trials here, so it's A, B, C, C, B, A, um, but it's a way to kind of equally balance these things across. Um, and so we have, again, if we're just gaining one unit every time, um, the first condition, there's, they don't have any practice effects because they've never done it. By the second trial, they're a little bit better, so we add one. The third trial, they're one better than they were before, so we're up to two. The fourth trial, we're one better than we were before, so we're up to three. The fourth, the, the fifth trial, we're one better than we were before, so we're up to four. And the Sixth trial, we're one better than we were before, so we're up to five. But because we have these balanced, um, we've counterbalanced these treatments where we have A, B, C, um, so A both starts the study and ends the study, and B and C are in the middle in kind of equal spacing, what we end up having then um, is these really balanced practice effects because um, we end up getting an added five practice effects for each condition. Um, if you look at, again, trial A, trial 1 and trial 6 are our condition A. We add those two practice effects together, we get 5. Um, for condition B, we add the practice effects of 1 and 4 together. 
we get five. For condition C, we add the practice effects of two and three together, we get five. Um, so again, this is a very linear kind of practice effect. Um, on the six trials, if you were to draw a line, if you were to graph this practice effect, it would be a nice straight line. And every time, we're just getting a little bit better. So what we need to do to balance for these practice effects, to counterbalance for these practice effects, um, is do a, uh, a different administration um, of this the um, conditions so that we're balancing this out and this is being balanced out across the participant um, so again in one participants getting two examples of each of them and so we're balancing the practice effects within the participant as well an example of nonlinear practice effects is again that aha moment somehow they figure out what's going on, let's say it's happening um, on the third trial, and they're then using these tr this, this new information that they have for their subsequent trials. Well, if we do that same sort of counterbalancing we did before, that ABBA counterbalancing, um, and we have, um, we get a little bit better when we get to trial um, two, um, we have that aha moment in trial C, and then we use that information that we've learned in trial C on our subsequent trials. So again, this is where we have our aha moment right here at C. Um, we do not have these balanced across the conditions because of that aha moment. So ABBA counterbalancing is not really good for nonlinear practice effects because condition A has practice effects of five in our theoretical um, situation here. Um, B has practice effects of six and C has practice effects of ten. Um, so again, we do not have these practice effects equally balanced over all three of our conditions. Because of that, we've allowed something else to co-vary with our in our manipulation of the independent variable. So then if we have differences between group A, group B, and group C, we can't say that they're necessarily due to chance, I mean necessarily due to our manipulation of the um, of our independent variable. Um, it could then be due to these practice effects. It could just be um, that we won't, because we figured it out on C, we're just much, much better. Um, these sorts of things. You could again have negative practice effects where we're kind of getting bored, we kind of hit a, a brick wall where we no longer care anymore, and that could still be um, a nonlinear practice effect. Um, again, so this is not balanced equally um, with this methodology, which is why we have different ways to counterbalance. Um, and we're going to talk about those on this subsequent slide. So there's two main ways we can balance things. We can completely um, balance them. Again, we showed you that with the goldfish crackers. Um, and we can incompletely or partially balance um, these um, practice effects. So for complete repeated measures design with complete um, counterbalancing, these are practice effects are balanced within each participant um, of a complete repeated measures design. So each participant experiences each condition several times, and we use a different order each time of conditions. Um, this allows us to equally place the, um, the conditions in different orders. Um, sometimes they're first, sometimes they're last, these sorts of things, um, so that everything has um, every opportunity of proceeding and following everything else. We use these um, when, again, it's very brief. Um, we have simple judgments about stimuli, a key press, these sorts of things, where we're not asking the participants to really do a lot um, for our measurement of our dependent variable. Um, when we have really simple kinds of manipulations, we can do this. Um, if you've got, again, a really um, complex independent variable that takes a, a lot of time um, to manipulate the participant, whether it be through a treatment, um, some or, um, other kind of setup, those sorts of things, then we're not going to be able to do that. Um, again, it really is these really simple things where we can do these complete designs. The easiest way to do this um, is block randomization, um, which is, again, we've talked about before. And the goldfish cracker um, example I gave you in the previous um, um, video um, was a, an example of, block, uh, of block randomization. Remember, a block, just like it did with between subjects design, still consists um, of all conditions. So if we have four conditions, A, B, C, and D, A, B, C, and D could be a block. So could C, B, D, A, uh, D, B, C, A, these sorts of things, all examples of a block. 
<clears throat> and we're going to generate a random order of the block. And the participant will complete each block. But what's different in a complete design is that each participant completes all of the blocks. So if you have um, four different conditions, we have 24 different blocks um, that are possible. And so for a complete design, each participant would need to complete all 24 blocks. So that's 24 blocks times four. Um, so you can see how this could be a really big, long, time-consuming design, um, which is again why we can only do it with really simple kinds of measurements. Um, so if we're talking about key presses, things like that, that would be something you could do with four conditions um, and and uh, and do a complete design. Block randomization is really nice though um, because it can balance these practice effects um, in really equal ways. We know within each participant that the order of the conditions really doesn't matter because we've we've counterbalanced that out. We've given them every possible order um, so it can't just be something about A, B, C, D because we've given them every other order possible order of those four conditions. Um, so we really, and that, and we do that within each participant. Um, so we're not only going to balance these um, across participants, we're going to balance them within participants as well. Um, so again, we really know that there's not anything going on here with practice effects because we've done a really good job of balancing these out by giving the participants every possible um, block. And then these practice effects, just like we saw um, in the um, example with linear practice effects, get balanced or averaged out across the many presentations of the conditions. Um, so again, because we know these practice effects will be different, um, we're going to be able to average those out and again, um, do that within each participant so that we really um, basically cancel out this being any way um, and a threat to internal validity. We're able to cancel this out because again, we're not allowing it to co-vary with our manipulation of the independent variable. By kind of creating the situation where we've had all of these different possibilities, um, because they've been given every possible um, order, practice effects can't be an issue. We've been able to counterbalance those out. Um, practice events, however, are not balanced um, if we only present them a few times um, to each participant. Again, they have to be presented many, many times um, in, in this block randomization design. ABBA counterbalancing is again, we talked about that, it was in the example before, and this is used when um, conditions are only presented a few times to each participant, so we don't have to do the many times here. Um, and what we do here is the procedure, we present one random order of a sequence, and it can be any random order, D, A, B, C, and then we present the opposite sequence, C, B, A, D. Um, Again, because we've done this mirror image across the middle here. Um, so if you look at ABBA, if you draw a line between the two Bs, that's what I'm talking about, the, middle, the mirror image. They're kind of reflections of each other. Um, and you saw on that linear practice effects line how because of that, each condition has the same amount of practice effects. The same is true in a condition with um, two conditions, three conditions, four conditions, five conditions. Um, we, if we have linear practice effects, we can really, really use this. Um, if we don't have linear practice effects, we should not be using them. If we have nonlinear practice effects, then we need to be concerned about um, using this kind of design. They should also not be used when anticipation effects can occur. So if your participant's not supposed to know what condition's coming next, um, then this is not the one to use. If this is something that, if having an anticipation of what condition's gonna come next can influence their behavior, then you really shouldn't use this um, because they're going to develop expectations because we as humans are really, really good at picking out patterns. Um, and let's face it, this is kind of an easy pattern to pick out. Um, so again, um, we should not be using this um, when um, anticipation effects could alter um, performance on our study um, because then again we'd have a, a, an issue with internal validity. So again, because humans are really good at picking out these patterns, they're going to develop expectations and those expectations can change behavior um, and that's why um, they can be problematic. But again, this is only when those expectations um, uh, will affect 
um, your dependent variable um, when there's something that you that the participant really shouldn't be knowing. Um, and then again, these responses um, may be influenced by the expectations rather than our manipulation of the independent variable. So again, we've allowed something else. In this case, on um, this example, expectation effects, um, anticipation effects to co-vary with our independent variable. Um, so then we don't know if if it really the change in our dependent variable is because of our manipulation or it's because of these anticipation effects. Um, so again, if that's something that's going to be problematic, um, really um, you should be using block, block randomization um, rather than ABBA counterbalancing because it's just going to do a better job um, of controlling for that. Because obviously you've seen, you saw the blocks with the um, the goldfish, I mean, you, you can't guess that. You can't guess what's coming next there because it's random. Um, and, and and there are random blocks, and the blocks are in random orders. Um, so anticipation effects aren't there. So if those are something that you really need to be concerned about, and this is, again, depending on your research question, um, then block randomization is a better choice. Um, so in two blocks, um, you have, you could have, a, B, B, A. Um, the idea here is to show you how quickly we get to blocks. Um, and, and you could have this, this looks like A, B, B, A counterbalancing, but that is actually a, a random block, um, a random option for block randomization. It could have been B, A, um, A, B, you know, or, uh, you know, it just has to do more here with the issues that there's only two possible blocks um, in that. Three conditions, um, that's six blocks. Um, so if you have three conditions and if you're doing block randomization, you need to do all six blocks for each participant. Um, so that gets really high, really fast. And again, the longer your um, manipulation is, the harder that is to really do. Again, we talked about four blocks, four conditions being 24 blocks. If you look at two, page 270 of your text, it has them all listed there and, and it gives you the equation to really see how many conditions translates to how many different blocks um, you have. At five conditions, you have 120 blocks, and at six conditions, you have 720 blocks. And um, so you can really quickly see how these things may not work. Um, these things really may not be an issue. And that's why we have things like ABBA counterbalancing. Um, so that if you have six conditions, um, you can do two random, you can do one random order of six and then the mirror image of it. Um, and you can balance those practice effects. And again, you can do that um, when you're dealing with linear practice effects um, and when you don't have to worry about anticipation effects. Those are going to be, you know, less time consuming options um, than um, block randomization is. And again, both of these um, are going to be um, examples of the complete design. Um, when you have, again, more time consuming, longer kinds of things, you can do um, incomplete or partial counterbalancing. So the general rule for this kind of counterbalancing, um, this incomplete or partial, um, is that we're still trying to practice um, balance practice effects, um, and that we need to do each condition in each ordinal position equally often. So we're not going to be doing the same thing that we're doing with um, complete, where they're getting every different version, but we want A to be first. Um, and we want A to be second, and we want A to be third. Um, we want it to have every ordinal position. We want B to have been first, second, and third. We want C to have been first, second, and third. Um, if we follow this rule, then practice effects are balanced with um, across the various conditions, um, and then they won't confound the experiment. And again, this is the whole reason that we're doing this in the first place, the whole reason that we're doing counterbalancing is to balance the counter, these um, these practice effects, and to, to eliminate confounds. So there's two main techniques for this. Um, again, we have all possible orders, and we have selected orders. Um, all possible orders we can use, again, when there's four or fewer conditions. It's the same reason um, that we had this with complete designs. It has to do with the number of, um, of conditions. So if you have um, two conditions, you have two orders, 
um, and you can assign half the participants to one and half the participants um, to the other. So in this situation, they're not going to be, instead of how we saw in complete, the participants would get A, B, and B, A. Here in incomplete, half the participants will get A, B, and the other half of the participants will get B, A. Um, so again, we're dealing with um, a different kind of... Um, counterbalancing here. Um, this is again for longer um, administrations um, of the independent variable. So again, we're going to split it. Um, each We're not going to be able to then balance practice effects within each individual, but we are able to balance them across the conditions, um, which is still can be um, just as beneficial and just as helpful. If we have three conditions, we have six possible orders, um, and again, you will divide your group of people into six. Um, a sixth of them will participate in ABC, a sixth of them will participate in AC, ACB, a sixth will participate in BC, BAC, a sixth will participate in BCA, a sixth will participate in CAB, and a sixth will participate in CBA. So that again, we have equally um, distributed and randomly assigned um, a participant to one of the six orders. Um, we have an equal number of these in each of them. Um, so that again, we're balancing these practice effects really equally over um, the entire experiment, not within each participant, um, but across participants. Once we get to four conditions, again, we're up to 24 orders, five conditions at 120 orders. Most of the time, you don't want to have to do a study that has 120 um, people in it. And if you're doing this kind of design, this incomplete counterbalancing, you need to have a participant for every possible order. So that's why we really use this only with four and below. Um, because once we make that jump to five, we really get a huge number um, of orders. And you have to have a participant for every single order um, for this to work. Six conditions, 720. Rarely do you have a study that has 720 people in it. Um, in psychology. So um, that's not some sort of survey design where you're doing a manipulation. Rarely would you have an experimental design that has this. Um, so again, um, that's a really huge number. And so that's why we only really use this with four and below um, because we've got numbers that we can work with. Because again, we have to have at least one participant receiving each order of the conditions. Um, therefore, all possible orders are used for experiments we only really use it with four or fewer because rarely um, are you wanting to have to do 120 orders um, and definitely not 720. Um, so again, we're really only using this with studies that have four or fewer conditions, which really is a lot of studies. I mean, rare, again, we talked about this. You don't want to water down your study so much that you have so many conditions that you can't really see any effects. Um, it's, again, that balancing act of not having too few conditions and not having too many conditions. Um, but four or fewer usually still allows this to be used with a lot of different designs. And this is probably one of the, um, the most common kinds of um, counterbalancing um, because it really is an easy, simple way to do it. You have every possible order um, and you have one person participate in each order. Selected orders. Um, we do this, we select particular orders of conditions to balance practice effects. There's two methods for this, um, one of which is Latin square, um, and the other is random starting order with rotation. Um, both of these, um, we, can, we can use them with four or, or fewer. Um, it really just has to do with the number of people you need in your study, the number of conditions you have, and the kinds of practice effects that you think you're going to have and the kinds of issues that you think you're going to have with practice effects. Um, the important thing is here, um, just like with incomplete counterbalancing as a whole, each condition appeals in each ordinal position at least once. Um, so again, A gets to be first, B gets to be first and C gets to be first. They each get to be second. They each get to be third. They've been in each ordinal position at least once. And then participants are randomly assigned to one of the orders of the conditions, just like we saw um, in the all possible orders. So the procedure for Latin square, um, and there's lots of different ways to do this. It all comes out the same. Your book talks about it slightly different, um, but it, it equates to the, the same thing. 
So you randomly order the conditions in the experiment. Um, a, B, C, D is an actual a random order. <laughs> so we can use that one just for simplicity. simplicity. Um, but it can be any random order um, of the conditions. You number the conditions. Um, so we'll number A, number one, B, number two, C, number three, D, number four. Um, and we just do this because we're going to have to use some math here in the Latin square. Um, um, so by making them numerical, the math works because A plus one doesn't really mean anything otherwise. Um, so this is the general rule for um, doing the first order. <clears throat> you do one, two, th and then N. Now, remember again, what does N stand for? Um, we use N in terms of the number of participants because we're talking about conditions here. N is going to be the number of conditions. So if we're in our example here are dealing with four conditions, it would be one, two, four, three. And then four minus one um, would be the next one. So again, um, this would be the order. If you're dealing with six conditions, it would be one, two, six, three, four five, four, and then so on and so on. Um, so again, um, where n is the last number of conditions. So the first order we would get from this Latin square is one, two, four, three, because we take a is one. Um, you can see we have the one is the, the general rule, two is from the general rule, four is the n, and three um, is our, um, as again from that general rule. So again, we're using this. To generate the second order of conditions, we add one to each number of the first order. So our first order was one, two, four, three. Because n represents the number of conditions, um, we can't add one to four because that'll give us five conditions. So we'll go back to one um, for that. So it will n plus one will always be the first condition. So the second order would then be two, three, one, four. So if you look at that, we took one, look at our, our, our general, um, our second order, our first order of conditions. So one, two, four, three. Write that out on a piece of paper. One, two, four, three. And then just add one to each of those numbers. Um, so one plus one is two. One plus two is three. One plus four is five. Well, we can't have five because we only have four conditions. So that's going to revert back to one. And one plus three is four. You can see then that matches up to what we have here for our second second order of conditions, two, three, one, four. And to generate the third number of conditions, we're going to do the exact same thing, only we're going to do this to our second order. So take two, three, one, four, add one to two, that gives us three, add one to three, that gives us four, add one to four, one that gives us two and add one to four well we can't do that so we have to revert back to one and that's what we have our third order is three four two one and we keep doing this over and over again um, until we have the number of orders is the same as the number of conditions. So if we have four conditions, we need to have four orders. If we have 16 conditions, we need to have 16 orders. Um, because again, this will allow each number, each condition to appear equally in each ordinal position is what this is, is allowing us to do. And that's what's really, really important. Having each condition in each ordinal position an equal number of times is what's balancing those practice effects. So is being first somehow helpful? Well, it doesn't matter because everybody's been first the equal number of times. Is being last somehow helpful? Well, it doesn't matter because everybody's been last an equal number of times. Is somehow being the third condition really helpful? Well, it doesn't matter because everybody's equal, every condition's equally been third. Um, so again, by balancing, by having everybody appear in each ordinal position, the same number of times, this is what's allowing us to balance out these practice effects. So for example, um, here in this um, image of a Latin square, we see A is in the first position, A is in the second position, um, is in the last position in the second order, and the third order, it's in the second position, and in the fourth order, it's in the third position. You could do the same thing for B. In the first order, B is in the second position. In the second order, B is in the first position. In the third order, B is in the third position. And in the fourth order, B is in the fourth position. And this is true of C and D too. Um, so again, we have they're equally in the, each place. 
We have four orders because we have four conditions. Um, again, this is allowing um, this equal position um, of ordinality. Another advantage of the Latin square is that each condition precedes and follows every other condition. So if somehow um, B does better when it follows A, well, it doesn't matter because B only is going to follow A once, and we're going to balance this out. Is there somehow something different um, between B preceding A? Um, again, we have follows and precedes equally one time. Um, so if you look at this, we have A preceding B, we have B following A um, in the fourth position. So you can see that this is happening. Um, this is helping to control for potential order effects because sometimes it's not just being first or last. Sometimes it can be some of this carryover effect. Um, so again, by balancing these out equally, we're really minimizing um, any kinds of these effects because it's only really happening once um, and it's not happening repeatedly. The next one we're going to do, um, all possible orders with rotation, um, we, we don't have this benefit. This is something that's only seen in Latin square, um, where A will both proceed and follow B. Um, C will both proceed and follow D. Um, D will both proceed and follow A. Um, these sorts of things. We don't have this um, in um, the, the rotation methodology. So here it is, random starting order with rotation. Um, again, you're going to generate a random order of conditions. And again, A, B, C, D is technically can be a random order. So we'll just say that that was our random order. We'll rotate the sequence by moving each condition one position each time. So um, I don't know where my little numbers are here. Sorry for the glitch there. Let's go ahead and start the slide over again. Um, so random order starting with rotation um, is, um, is different than Latin square. Um, we start out the same way. We still generate that random order of conditions. A, B, C, D um, is again an example of a random order of conditions. And then what we'll do is we'll just rotate the sequence by moving a condition one position um, in this example down each time or to the left each time, um, depending on if you're if you're going kind of horizontally or vertical. In this example, we're going vertically, um, so it would be actually moving it up one time. So if you look at this, our first order is A, B, C, D. Um, what we then do is we move everything kind of one position up, so we have B, C, D, and then A gets pu pushed back to the bottom. Um, we'll do that for the third, we'll move everything up a position, so C was in the second position, well now C is in the first position, and then D and A and B follow suit. Um, D was in the second position in the third order, so D gets moved up a position, um, is now in the first position, and A, B, and C follow suit. We still have the, the condition mat where each condition appears in each ordinal position the equal number of times. So this still allows us to balance practice effects. And as you can see, this is a lot easier um, than doing a Latin square. But the problem is, unlike a Latin square, the order of conditions is not balanced. Um, so D always follows C unless it's starting. Um, B always follows A unless it's starting. Um, so again, we, we still have this kind of, um, we don't have this option that we did with Latin square with A both proceeds and follows B. Um, we have A always preceding B um, unless A is last and B is first. Um, and so we don't necessarily have that same um, order of conditions kinds of balance that we do have with Latin square. But again, these are really dependent on the kinds of questions we're asking and the kinds of practice effects that we're, kind of, we're trying to balance. What kind of our study looks like makes a decision on what kind of counterbalancing we're going to need to do. So to compare the two designs again, um, our differences between within subjects design and between subjects design um, is kind of our manipulate how we manipulate the independent variable and who gets the independent variable. Within subjects, each participant experiences 
every condition of the independent variable. So if we have three levels of the independent variable, well, everybody gets all three levels. But again, back to the between subjects design, each participant only gets one level of the independent variable. So again, if we have three levels, um, then each participant only gets one level. Um, and again, it, it changes how we ask the question and it changes um, what becomes the biggest um, confound, the biggest control issue. Um, for between subjects designs, really we individual differences is our big problem. Um, and within subjects design, really eliminate that. But within subjects design have the issues of practice effects. Um, so again, they both have their problems. Um, and it really comes down to the kinds of research questions you're asking. What is being balanced across um, each condition is different um, depending on the kinds of studies. Um, so within subjects designs, we're balancing practice effects. That's what we're kind of controlling for. We're doing this to rule out these alternative explanations for our findings. In between subjects designs, it's individual differences. Um, and again, you'll notice that the things that we're balancing, we're averaging, we're controlling for in each of these kinds of designs are our biggest threats. These are the things that we're most concerned about. In both studies, we're going to have to control for environmental factors. We're going to have to control for researchers, environment, those sorts of things. Um, but they each of these have their own particular nuances and their own particular problems. Um, and so these are the things that we balance for. The statistical analysis of a within subjects design is very similar to between groups. Um, we'll do two conditions will still be a t-test, three or more conditions will be an ANOVA. The difference is, um, is we'll, do a, we'll do a different methodology. Instead of it being independent groups, there's a repeated measures version um, for each um, t-test and ANOVAs, and we'll get into both of those. Um, so this, the rule still applies. If you've got two conditions, let's do a t-test because it's simpler but we'll be doing a repeated measures t-test. If you have three conditions or more, um, let's do an ANOVA. Again, you can do an ANOVA with two conditions, um, but it really, a t-test is just a lot easier statistically um, to calculate. But we'll be using these repeated measures versions of the, t of the tests. So let's talk about an example. This is actually um, some of my research. Um, so I, I know it rather intimately. Um, and this is actually um, a, a technically a factorial design, um, which means it has two independent variables, um, one of which is something that's more of a subject variable, age, um, and one of which is actually a manipulated variable, which was the kind of infant directed speech, which is IDS. Um, so age is going to be between subjects factor in this example. So we can't do both four and six month olds. We're not testing them at four and at six. Um, we're testing them at four um, and then we're testing a different group of six month olds. So it's a between subjects factor. Whereas the kind of infant directed speech they get is a within subjects factor. Um, I know I mentioned this in class, but again, infant directed speech is kind of the way we all talk to babies. And I've got some examples coming up, but it's again those really um, exaggerated ways that we talk to babies. So when a baby does something really great and you're really proud of them, oh, good job. That's not how I talk to you. When you do when you do well on a paper, I'm not gonna be like, oh, that's a wonderful job you did. That's not how I talk to you. That's because I talk to you in adult directed speech. Um, whereas infant directed speech um, is very different. But as infant directed speech is going to be within subjects factor, they're going to, infants are going to get both conditions of the infant directed speech. And the two conditions we're going to be looking at is um, comforts and approvals. And there'll be more details on that. So we had um, our participants, we had 24 month olds, we had 26 month olds. Um, their mean days are there, their ranges are there. Again, this is important information to give um, because it, it really tells you about the kind of the, the subjects we were dealing with. So we had um, two categories of infant directed speech and what we did is we had um, women come into the lab and they watched videos and they were asked to respond to the babies in the videos like these were real babies in the room and we recorded them doing this. And so we had both comforts and approvals um, from different women. Um, so here's an approval. You're a good, You're a good boy. boy. 
You can hear that's kind of higher pitch. You can see that the facial, um, uh, she's got lots of smiles that go with it. And here's our comfort. It's okay. It's okay. You can hear that's a lot lower. Um, and what we'll see is um, that in the two categories of infant directed speech, approvals are a lot higher in pitch or frequency. Comforts are a lot lower. Um, approvals go up in pitch um, or go up and then fall. Comforts generally just fall. Um, so we'll see differences um, in the patterns of how these sound. Um, and we see these differences across different cultures. So we really do think there's something important about infant directed speech. We think there's something adaptive about infant directed speech. And we think one of those things is um, that it communicates what adults are thinking and feeling before babies understand words. But for this to be true, kids have to be able to tell that these categories are different. For kids to be able to pick up the meaning um, that when mom uses the high pitch sound, she's happy, and when mom uses the low sound, she wants to calm me down, um, they have to know that these are different categories of speech. Um, so we're looking at the categorization um, of how infants can tell these two categories apart. And what we did is we had um, infants sit on their parents' lap, um, and they were about a meter from um, a Sony HD TV. Um, and you can see there that mom had headphones on. Mom was told to either close her eyes or look down at the baby's head um, so that she couldn't see or respond in any way to the videos, um, that the baby was really just responding and wasn't picking up any cues from mom. Um, we wanted still mom to hold the babies because they're obviously in a new place. They're saying different things, um, and they're, they're a lot happier and more willing to participate in parents' lap um, than they are in a high chair. So this is why we do that. So we started the study um, with a control event. We showed this both at the beginning and the end. And we did this to kind of compare looking times across these um, to make sure that because we're dealing with four and six month olds, that they weren't really just getting tired. Um, so as an additional measure of practice effects, um, we included this control so we could look at something completely different at the beginning and the end and see if they really just got tired at the end. If they're not looking longer at the end, is it because that they don't think these things are different? or because they're just tired. Um, so this is what our practice event looked like. Oh, it didn't do it. It was just a little drum sequence. It went over and over and over again um, in that video. Um, so what we did is we habituated infants, and habituate um, is just a really big word to say we basically got them used to or got them bored with something. So we would give them six different people saying six different things, um, but they would all say it in the same category. So this is the C's stand for comfort. So we'd have the first person saying one comfort, the second person saying a different comfort, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. And you can see here we also tried to, um, we had a pretty diverse sample of infants coming in. Um, so we wanted to have a pretty diverse sample of faces as well. Um, so we still wanted to stick with women um, for, for numerous reasons that we can get into in class if you'd like to talk about that. Um, but we really did um, want to have ethnically um, diverse women to really, so that everybody kind of had somebody that was a familiar um, a familiar ethnicity to them. We then give them two trials that they'd already seen. So we give them two videos that they'd already seen really just to make sure that are you really bored with this? And the reason that we get them bored in the first place is because we're just recording looking times. And we're going to ask them now, okay, now we're going to give you the test trials. Do you think that these things are different or the same as what you've been looking at? Do these fit in the category um, that, that we've gotten you bored with? Um, if they fit in the category, well, you should still be bored with them. Um, if you don't think they belong in that category, if you think that they're in a separate category, you shouldn't be bored anymore. And this is, again, where we get into the within subjects design. They're going to both get the control test trials and the experimental test trials. So our control test trials were comforts that they hadn't heard before. They had seen these people before. Um, they had seen comforts before, but these were comforts they hadn't seen before. Um, so for, for speaker six, maybe um, her A comfort was, oh, it's okay. But her B comfort was, oh, don't cry. Those are different. Um, so that it was still something new, but it was still fit into that category. So the idea was that if they really are paying attention to the category, they should not think these are new um, because they fit into that comfort category, even though they have um, 
seen um, the, uh, they haven't seen these particular comforts before. Then we'll give them the experimental trust trials, um, which is the different category. So if they were habituated to comforts, we would then give them approvals at the end and see if the approvals um, uh, elicited their attention again. Are you interested in looking at this now because you think it's different? Um, again, if they don't think approvals fit into the comfort category, they should look a lot longer. They should be interested again. Um, and I'll show you a video of how this works. We also um, counterbalance the order of the test trials um, to just make sure that that wasn't a problem as well. Half the infants received um, approvals. They received their experimental followed by their control, and the others received their control followed by their experimental. So that again, we really didn't have any issues of that. So this next slide is a video of a six-month-old, um, and what he sees is on the right. Um, and how we can tell he's looking um, is if you look at his eyes, there'll be a little reflection in his eyes. That's the reflection of the TV screen in his eyes, and that's how we can tell he's looking. So here we go. Okay. So you can see the little drum going. And again, we're just doing this at the beginning and the end to see if he's interested. This is a um, infant control design, so when he looks at the screen, the video comes up. When he looks away, it goes away. So you can hear he's being habituated to comforts. He looks away, goes away. And you can hear, even though they're all saying something different, they still have that same pattern. He's starting to get bored. Mom, what are you doing? I'm kind of bored here. You can see he looks a lot less time. So he's becoming habituated. And we defined habituation as looking 50% less at the end than he did at the beginning. So those are going to be his post-hab trials. He's already seen these. He's definitely still bored. He kind of looks away pretty quickly. There are his approvals. So this is his experimental test trials. And then here are his control test trials. And then he'll get the drum at the end just to make sure he's bored. I mean, that he's not just tired. But he's so bored, he doesn't even want to look back. <laughs> And you can see he's looking at a pretty good time. So he's not just tired. Um, he really um, was answering our questions for us. So then what we did is we compared tr blocks of looking times. So we compared our uh, within subjects. Um, again, it was a within subjects design. So we had multiple trial blocks for each individual. We had the trial block where they, they got habituated, where they hit that criterion of 50%. 
We had the mean of the trials to just to really make sure that they're habituated. We had the mean of their experimental test trial, I mean their control test trials, and the mean of their experimental test trials. And what we really were looking at was to see if there was a difference between their control test trials and their experimental test trials. We want to see a difference um, also to some extent from um, the end of habituation and the mean of the post-hab trials, but really the crucial difference here um, is the difference between our experimental and control test trials. And again, this is a within subjects factor. So we're able to compare each kid basically to their own, um, their own they're acting as their own control which for infants is really, really good um, because he was actually a really pretty fast kid. Um, infants could look anywhere between um, a second and 60 seconds at each one of those videos, and he didn't look very long at any of them. He kind of got the information pretty quickly and moved on. Some of the kids look a minute at each video, um, and, and some of them habituate. It takes them a lot longer to habituate. He habituated in six trials. Sometimes it took 15 um, trials, 18 trials to get to habituation. Um, so again, there was differences in looking time a lot. There's a lot of variability in infant look times. And we know that from the literature, which is one of the main reasons um, that we try and do them as a within subjects design. It's also really helpful, again, because we're dealing with babies and babies are a hard population to work with. Um, but mostly it's because of the variability. Individual differences is a big issue um, in infant studies. And so by allowing each kid to be their own control, um, we really can balance this out. Um, so again, we're really interested in seeing differences um, between these two groups. Again, we looked at this as a control event, um, and we did a t-test just to make sure that there was no difference between them, and you see it's not significant t, which is actually what we were looking for there. We didn't want there to be a difference um, between the looking at the beginning and the end, which means that as a whole they weren't fatigued. So here we did ANOVAs, which we'll get into later. Um, so we have F statements for these. And we found that six month olds, we had a significant F, um, which means that they did, there was a difference between the four conditions, the four trial blocks. Um, we looked at four month olds and that was not significant. So that means there was no difference um, between the four trial blocks. And if you look at the graph here, we have the four trial blocks, and then we have the, the mean looking time in seconds. Um, and the dark line is six month olds, and the, um, the khaki line or the gray line is four month olds. And again, what we're really looking at for is this right here, this increase between within category and between category. Um, looking times. Um, when we see that that rise that we see with the six month olds between those control and, te and experimental test trials, that's evidence of categorization. Um, so we do see categorization with six month olds, but we don't see it with four month olds. And we went in um, and actually did a second analysis um, where we looked at just that difference between the control test trials, the within category test trials, and between category test trials. Really, is there a difference here? Um, and there was. So that's what that significant F was being driven by this. And we'll get into this when we get into ANOVA. Um, ANOVA is an omnibus test. It just tells us there's a difference somewhere in the data that you gave me. So you gave me four different trials. Um, somewhere in those four different trials, there's a difference. But I don't know where that difference is because I'm a I'm an omnibus test I'm kind of an overall test and then so if you want to go in and see well where is this difference um, then you need to do a pairwise comparison and that's what we did um, and so we compared just um, within category versus between category and saw a difference so these are our results. Here comes our discussion. Um, what do those results mean? It means that six-month-olds could categorize approving and comforting infant-directed speech when we gave them the audio and the video visual information synced up um, and everything in natural presentation, where four-month-olds showed no evidence of categorization um, given that information. So again, um, this is just kind of an example that kind of shows you um, what kind of the benefits of a within subject design, why this is really helpful. But it also shows you that you can kind of have more complex designs that we'll get to later on, um, where they're both kind of between subjects and within subjects, um, and kind of the issues that both have. Um, so again, um, I hope that was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Email me, um, see in the discussion boards, any of that. Um, 
hopefully we don't have a nice day on Wednesday. It looks like it's supposed to snow again. Um, so let's, let's all uh, keep our fingers crossed. And I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks. Bye.